Our first speaker is Dr. Charles Wyckoff. Dr. Wyckoff is a world-renowned ophthalmologist with the Retina Consultants of Texas. He's chairman of the Research and Clinical Trials Committee for the Retina Consultants of America and deputy chair of ophthalmology for the Blanton Eye Institute, Houston Methodist Hospital. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed manuscripts and is a frequent speaker at national and international academic meetings. His research interests pertain to angiogenesis, retinal vascular diseases, atrophic retinal diseases, and vitreal retinal surgical topics. Dr. Wyckoff is going to give us an overview of the biological role of the angiopoietin and tie system in vascular stabilization, immunomodulation, and tissue function. Hello, I'm Charles Wyckoff, retina specialist in Houston, Texas, and it's a privilege to be able to discuss the angiopoietin tie system and its role in vascular stabilization. This content was developed as a collaboration between the Angenesis Foundation and Genentech Roche. This is a high level overview and I'll read this in a moment, but the point of this presentation is to really discuss angiopoietin one, angiopoietin two, and the TIE2 transmembrane receptor and define its role in vascular biology. So from an overview perspective, first, Vascular growth control is complex and involves many factors beyond VEGF to guide neovascularization and permeability. Second, vessel permeability is a physiological function and is mediated by pericytes and cell-to-cell -cell tight junctions. Third, angiopotin one and angiopotin two are competitive ligands for the type two receptor on endothelial cells, influencing vessel architecture. Fourth, angiopoietin one is responsible for vascular stabilization physiologically. And finally, angiopoietin two is responsible for destabilizing blood vessels physiologically. So when you look at this holistically, it can be overwhelming. There's an incredible amount of detail that goes into the thought process behind neovascularization and vascular permeability. But the goal here is to break this down into simplistic and yet scientifically meaningful chunks of information and to try to use preclinical and ex vivo models to understand the role of angiopoietins and TIE2 signaling in vascular biology. So let's jump in. First of all, what are the functional elements of the microcirculation and where does angiopoietin 1 and angiopoietin 2 come from? Well, endothelial cells obviously are the tubes through which our blood courses and they contain Y-bell palade bodies which store angiopoietin 2. In comparison, angiopoietin 1 is expressed by pericytes. You know, pericytes line the normal vasculature throughout much of our body. But remember also that platelets also express angiopoietin 1. So in this context, both ANG1 and ANG2 are potential ligands for the transmembrane endothelial specific tyrosine kinase receptor TI2. Now that's a mouthful. But essentially, this receptor shown in the middle here has both an extracellular domain shown in the white and an intracellular domain shown in sort of the light pink here at the bottom. And it crosses across the cell membrane shown in the middle. That means that when angiopoietin 1 binds to this receptor, it causes intracellular signal. We'll talk about that in depth. But the overarching theme here is that along with VEGF, the angiopoietin tie axis changes vascular stability and permeability during development and in response to physiologic challenges. So this current illustration demonstrates what we think of as a normal stabilized vasculature. But with physiologic challenges, those listed at the bottom, for example, exercise, wound healing, reproductive cycle, you can see a structured breakdown of the integrity of this vasculature such that you get vascular leakage outside of the normal vascular channels and localized inflammation. And we'll define each of those in a few minutes. But then as that physiologic challenge resolves, in most cases, the normal vasculature is able to be stabilized again. So how is this process happening? Well, we think it's driven in large part by angiopoietin 1 and angiopoietin 2 and the ratio between these two ligands for TI2. Let's talk first of all the next few slides about the role specifically of angiopoietin 1. Overall, think of ANG1 as triggering activation of TI2 and stabilization of blood vessel architecture. So what does this look like graphically? Well, on the left here now, as the 
and one ligand is bound to tie to, you can see intracellular signaling activated here by these little yellow beams at the bottom. We know that when that happens, TI2 then recruits pericytes to attach to the external walls of the blood vessel, leading to stabilization of blood vessels as shown in this elegant illustration. So what is a ex vivo or, or preclinical model that helps us understand this? Well, this is a mouse skin carcinogenesis model illustrated on the left and then quantified on the right. And you can see that ANG1 overexpression results in increased pericyte recruitment. In other words, as the levels of ANG1 are elevated relative to ANG2, you're more likely to have pericytes that are supporting and nourishing your endothelial cells. ANG1 is also an endothelial cell survival signal. So here is a preclinical model demonstrating that. You can see that as you add in more exogenous end of, um, angiopoietin 1 to this ex vivo endothelial cell culture, you can see that you are reducing levels of apoptosis. And this is quantified on the right here. Again, on the x-axis, you're seeing increasing levels of angiopoietin 1, driving a decrease in endothelial cell apoptosis. Angiopoietin 1 also inhibits VEGF-induced vascular permeability. So on the right of this slide, we're introducing a new cytokine, VEGF, little green circle there with the yellow outline, and also its receptor, VEGF transmem transmembrane receptor 2. And mediated through that process is a breakdown of, of, of vascular stabilization. But in the presence of TIE2 activation with ANG1 that's bound, you can see inhibition of that VEGF-driven vascular permeability. And that's because TIE2 really drives stabilization of the e cadherin and the adherins junctions, allowing an intact cell-to-cell -cell type junction, preventing egress of fluid from the capillaries into the extravascular space. When we look at this in a preclinical model, this is a human brain microvascular endothelial cell um, a model. You can see that as angiopoietin one levels are increased along the x-axis, you can see that permeability here is concordantly decreased. So putting this together from an angiopoietin one perspective, Angiopoietin 1 comes from platelets and pericytes and binds to and activates the TI2 transmembrane receptor on endothelial cells. This leads to tightening of endothelial cell tight junction and recruitment of pericytes which wrap around and support mature blood vessels, resulting in maintenance of vascular stability and homeostasis. So let's change gears now and talk about angiopoietin 2. Overall, think of angiopoietin 2 as destabilizing the, the, the vasculature in the human body. And the way this happens is that angiopoietin 2 directly competes with ANG1 for binding to the TI2 transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase and therefore facilitates vascular breakdown and neovascularization. So in a, a preclinical model here, you can see that under the resting state, there are very low levels of angiopoietin 2. And then as you physiologically challenge this preclinical model here, you're inducing an inflammatory response, you can see a meaningful, really a dramatic increase in angiopotent to expression shown by immunohistochemistry here with uh, the red signaling. So what does this look like from an illustrative perspective? Well, remember that angiopotent one and angiopotent two bind to the exact same receptor. There's not two different receptors for these molecules. They both bind to TI2 but only one of them is a strong agonist. When ANG1 is bound, just as we've talked about for the last many preclinical models, you get activity of the transmembrane tyrosine kinase receptor, you get increased intraocular signaling and driving that vascular stability phenotype. However, when the ratio of ANG2 to ANG1 changes and ANG2 is upregulated, now you will get competitive inhibition of ANG1 signaling because ANG2 is going to displace ANG1 when the levels of ANG2 are elevated from being bound to the TI2 receptor. And this then prevents TI2 intracellular signaling. So here's another um, ex vivo model showing that while ANG1 overexpression here can suppress retinal neovascularization, we know that ANG2 actually facilitates neovascularization. 
This is a model directly quantifying the avascular area. And on the left here, the purple bar shows an ANG1 overexpressed model where the area of the vascularization is reduced compared to a state in which angiopotin 2 is relatively overexpressed compared to ANG1 on the blue side of this bar on the left. We know that ANG2 binding leads to detachment of pericytes contributing to this increased vascular permeability context and subsequently breakdown of the underlying normal endothelial architecture. From a, a preclinical model, this has been quantified here. You can see that with ANG2 overexpression in the blue bars on the bottom, on the bottom right here, you can see a reduction in the number of pericytes. Again, ANG1 is driving pericyte survival and pericyte attachment to endothelial cells, whereas increased ANG2 levels is doing the opposite. It's driving a decrease in pericyte coverage of endothelial cells. We also know that the endothelial cell-to-cell -cell connections are decoupled in the presence of increased angiopoietin 2, leading to increased permeability. Here you can see a breakdown of those tight junctions between the endothelial cells with egress of the intravascular fluid into the extravascular space being driven by elevated levels of angiopoietin 2 um, compared to angiopoietin 1. This is a, a preclinical model here of a porcine retinal endothelial cells showing loss of these endothelial tight junctions. These are highlighted in the control baseline state on the left by the white arrows. And then on the right, you can see a dramatic uh, reduction in the number of these um, green um, um, lines highlighting these cell to cell tight junctions with ANG2 overexpression. So decoupling of these cell to cell tight junctions not only allows fluid egress, but it also allows extravasation of leukocytes. So here you're seeing these white blood cells migrate through these broken down endothelial cell-cell junctions. This causes a local inflammatory response and of course, local upregulation of cytokines. In a preclinical model here, this is a myocardial infarction model. You can see that um, in the middle here in an angiopoietin 2 native state, you can see significant extravasation of neutrophils quantified by these yellow slash green dots. Whereas on the right, under this myocardial infarction model, you can see there's a dramatic reduction in extravasation of these neutrophils um, in an angiopoietin 2 deficient model. And this is quantified on the right with that green bar, again, showing a dramatic decrease in the numbers of neutrophils that have left the vasculature into the adjacent tissue in an angiopoietin 2 deficient state. Again, indicating that upregulation of ANG2 is driving white blood cells out of the vasculature into the adjacent tissue. Let's put this all together from an angiopoietin 2 perspective. Overall, the concept of course being that overexpression of angiopoietin 2 is contributing to vascular breakdown and pathology. We know that endothelial cell tight junctions weaken, leading to vascular leakage with upregulation of angiopoietin 2 because the normal intracellular type 2 signaling is no longer able to um, occur. And simultaneously, in many of these pathologic states, we see upregulation of VEGF A, which simultaneously contributes to intracellular signaling through the VEGF receptor 2, which again is not inhibited uh, because now the TI2 transmembrane receptor tyrosine kinase is, is not active. The second point here is that there's an increased inflammatory response due to leukocyte migration out of these broken down cell cell type junctions. Third, we see pericyte dropout and loss of, of pericytes leading to further vascular destabilization. Fourth, we see vascular sprouting and neovascularization, particularly in the context of upregulation of VEGF A and signaling through VEGF receptor 2. And then finally, these immature leaky vessels can contribute to fibronectin deposition in the extracellular space, contributing to fibrosis. So multiple reports have suggested an imbalance in the angiopoietin ratio between ANG1 and ANG2 in multiple ocular diseases. And a couple of papers referenced here have reported elevated levels of angiopoietin 2 in patients with neovascular age-related macular degeneration that correlates with the disease severity and also elevated levels of ANG2 in diabetic retinopathy. So in summary, the objective of this presentation is to review the role of angiopoietin 2 um, angiopoietin 1 and TI2 in vascular biology. We know that angiopoietin TI signaling controls vascular stabilization 
um, in the context of varying levels of VEGF A. Angiopoietin 1 is responsible for recruiting pericytes, tightening cell cell junctions, and suppressing inflammation, while ANS2 competes with ANS1 binding to TI2 and reverses its effect, leading to the clinical effects of pericyte dropout, loosened cell cell junctions, increased vascular permeability, increased localized inflammation, and neovascularization, which is primarily driven through VEGF biology. Finally, overexpression of ANG2 can play a role, we believe, in the pathologic vascular features seen in neovascular AMD and diabetic retinopathy. Thank you for staying engaged through this angiopoietin tie biology discussion. I hope you found that useful, and I look forward to continuing to learn about this together moving forward.